Hey there, everyone. Welcome back to CBS News. I'm Errol Barnett. And I'm Lana Zak. Here's a quick look at some of the top stories we're following. House Democrats have chosen caucus chair Hakeem Jeffries of New York to replace Nancy Pelosi as leader of the Democrats in the chamber next year. That will make him the first black person to lead one of the two major parties in either chamber of Congress. The White House is hosting the first in-person summit on tribal affairs in six years. Today, President Biden emphasized his administration's commitment to respecting tribal nations. Leaders and representatives from hundreds of Nat Native American communities are attending this two-day summit. Plus, millions of people across parts of the South are cleaning up after a large system ripped through the region overnight. More than 20 tornadoes were reported and at least two people were killed. The same system is now bringing heavy rain to the Northeast. So a key economic indicator released today shows the U.S. economy grew in the third quarter. Slow clap, okay, because it's the first <laughs> increase the nation has seen this year. The new data shows the gross domestic product increase at an annual rate of 2.9% in the third quarter. Now, this rebound comes after six months of decline and looming fears of a recession. But consumer confidence in November and layoffs uh, and ongoing high inflation continue to pose problems. The latest data there reflects a gloomy outlook as we head into the holiday season. And private hiring increased by just 127,000 jobs this month. That's a steep drop from October, well below the 190,000 estimate. For more on all of this, let's bring in Ryan Payne. He's the president of Payne Capital Management. So, Ryan, considering there's a lot of data points uh, to unpack that Lana and I just walked through, what's the overall takeaway um, that this says about the state of the economy? I'm assuming that things aren't back to normal, so to speak, but they're not as bad as they were. You, you tell us. Yeah, I think the latter is it, right? Things are not as bad as uh, Wall Street strategists and economists have been telling you all year. Um, you know, th over almost 3% GDP growth, that's pretty good. And if you start looking at fourth quarter GDP growth, which we're starting to see forecasts on that, uh, it could be like over 4%. So that means growth is actually speeding up, not slowing down. That doesn't sound very recessionary to me, um, which I, I mean, I think that's a phenomenal number. And I think that's a very positive when we start looking you know, forward looking what the economy is going to do next year. So it sounds like uh, you think that Errol's slow clap was warranted. It was very slow. You couldn't hear it. It was so slow you couldn't hear it, <laughs> but it's but, valid. But I'm curious, of course, what the Fed's going to do. It's hinted that it might slow its interest rate hikes now that the job market seems to be slowing a mm. bit. Um, but we're, we haven't gotten, I think, a really clear message about how important Friday's jobs reporting is to their thinking. What more can you tell us? Well, I think it's going to be really hard to slow down the job market. And that sounds kind of counterintuitive. We want to stop right. people from having jobs. It doesn't make a lot of sense to me. And I think we have to think about it demographically speaking. You know, we have an aging population. Um, so, so, you know, demand for labor has been extremely high. I think it's going to continue to stay high. But we don't have enough Americans to fill those jobs, which means labor market is probably going to stay tight. No matter what the Fed does, then these wages are going to stay strong, which is good for the consumer. Um, but I do think the Fed is going to have to pivot because we saw the inflation data last month. It slowed. And right before the meeting next month, we're going to get another inflation number. And if that comes down again, well, the Fed's going to kind of be forced to look at the data and say, OK, wait, made it, maybe we need to raise interest rates a little bit slower here. And if they do that, I think that's going to be huge because markets now are starting to price in slower rate hikes. And maybe at some point the terminal rates like 5 percent next year, not to get too wonky. Well, you know, we've already adjusted to that reality. And I think that's the case. You know, that, that's a really good sign, especially if inflation is coming down, which it looks like on the ground floor, it clearly is. And we have to acknowledge what's happening in the background of these low numbers of, as far as employment is that people are striking like the railroad workers for better terms, more time off, so more comfortable jobs yeah. as well. That's yeah. happening also. Ryan Payne, great to yes. chat with you, though. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. All right, we're going to take a very short break. Stay with us. You're streaming CBS News Always On. So Twitter is no longer going to try and stop users from spreading false information about the coronavirus. Yeah, this latest change is one of many enforced by billionaire Elon Musk since he, he took control of the company just last month. Since 2020, Twitter had suspended more than 11,000 accounts and removed more than 100,000 pieces of content 
for violating its COVID-19 misinformation policy. The social media giant first introduced this rule during the early days of the pandemic. Well, joining us now is Rebecca Kern. She is a tech policy reporter for Politico. Uh, Rebecca, you reported on Elon Musk's latest pivot. Tell us what inspired this policy rollback. Yeah, it's it's a little unclear. Twitter didn't formally announce it. It was found on their existing COVID-19 misinformation websites um, that they just updated quietly um, on the Monday evening this week. And so it's in line, it appears, with Elon Musk's strategy of allowing more free speech on the platform. And he is allowing um, a lot more accounts back on that were previously banned. One of the more notorious ones was Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene, a Republican from um, Georgia, who had been banned from Twitter for spreading COVID-19 misinformation. So he allowed her back on last week, and now he's just decided he's not going to enforce the company's um, COVID-19 misinformation policy, which, as you stated, has been around for over two years. And has arguably, according to medical experts, um, stopped the spread of false content um, related to the virus and the vaccine. You know, the criticism Musk is facing now is that he just simply doesn't know what he's doing. This billionaire wanted to take over this website for personal reasons. Um, and the fact that he positions and says that, hey, I want a platform where there's free speech, and then he seems to have issue with folks criticizing him, people who criticize Musk, their accounts were suspended. He said he's nonpartisan, he's a centrist, and then he encourages folks to vote for Republicans before the midterm elections. Um, what's the reaction on Capitol Hill from, you know, not just politicians, but media professionals when they see someone seeing themselves as like, I'm a, a kind of an unopinionated arbiter of what's right, but actually behaving in a way where he's trying to give, um, you know, more, space to conservative voices, reinstating former President Trump's account, for example, and Trump hasn't even tweeted yet. What's the reaction been from folks? Right. Well, it's, it's a mixed reaction depending on which party you're talking to, right? So yeah. um, I spoke with some Republicans yesterday. They're happy to have Musk in his corner, uh, the world's richest man, you know, now tweeting in support of the Republican Party. He was asked on Twitter this weekend if he would support a Ron DeSantis presidential run in 2024. He said he would. So um, it's very, it's interesting to watch. It changes consistently. I am always on Elon Musk's Twitter feed. Um, whereas Democrats are raising alarms um, because they are concerned that there will be offline harms because COVID mm. misinformation is going to be spreading and no one's going to stop it. And, and that could lead to more unsafe actions, less masking, people, you know, making allegations that the vaccine's not safe. A lot of lies that Twitter, while they weren't able to stop them all, was were, they were actively trying and labeling and taking them down. Another huge factor as to why likely they've stopped enforcing is they physically don't have the staff. Um, yeah. Musk has now laid off like maybe two thirds of, of the company. We don't even know exactly how many people still work there, but a lot of them are content moderators. All right, Rebecca Kern, thank you. Are you excited? The yeah. U.S. is going to be facing the Netherlands this weekend, following a one to nothing victory over Iran. Yeah, and the person who gets this just awesome assignment is our foreign correspondent, Roxana Saberi. She joined Amory Green on CBS News Mornings to share what comes next for the U.S. men's national teams as they move on, on to the knockout stage of the World Cup. So, you know, a, a brilliant result for Team USA. What does this victory mean to the team and to the fans? Well, the victory means that the U.S. will advance out of this group stage, the round of 
16 for the first time since 2014. So the fans, of course, are ecstatic. This is a big deal for the team because after the U.S. failed to qualify for the World Cup four years ago, the team was overhauled. And in fact, only one player on this current roster has World Cup experience. There's also a new coach, Greg Berhalter, who was brought in. Now, this is one of the youngest teams here. And last night's starting lineup was the youngest of any team at this tournament so far, with the average age of 24 years and to be exact, 321 days, according to the U.S. Soccer Federation. Now, many observers thought this team's moment was still four years away when they'd be older, more experienced, and playing on home turf when the U.S. co-hosts the next World Cup, but the players proved otherwise so far. anne so obviously this was disappointing for Iran's team. Um, you know, someone's got to win, someone's got to lose. But I'm wondering if there are concerns for the well-being of the players once they return to Iran. Um, you know, they have certainly suggested, some of them, that they are supportive of the protests happening uh, in Iran. And I'm wondering if there are concerns. Yeah, and the, the players were navigating very difficult terrain, not just on the field, but off. They were under pressure to stay in line with the regime or to su show support for the protesters. And we know that Captain Esan Haj Safi had expressed some support before the team's first match. And then we saw the players abstaining from singing the anthem of the Islamic Republic in that game. I later asked forward Mehdi Taremi if the team was concerned about repercussions. He said no. But we also heard a Tehran official warning we will never allow anyone to insult Salt, our anthem and flag and in the team's next two matches they mostly mumbled along to the anthem or mouthed the words mm. now we know that when other athletes or other high profile figures have rebelled in certain ways they've had their passports confiscated when they returned to Iran or they've had to publicly apologize some have even been detained or worse. However, I should point out to Anne-Marie that some of these Iranian players won't be heading back to Iran. They'll actually be going to Europe or to the other countries where they play for clubs. But many still have family members in Iran, mm. Anne-Marie. Um, OK, back to the action uh, on the pitch. I think that's what you say. I don't even know the right terminology. Uh, the USA is going to be facing uh, the Netherlands. <laughs> yeah, good. OK, good. I faked it well enough. Uh, so the Netherlands is up next for uh, Team USA in the round of 16. Um, uh, what can we expect? What sort of team is the Netherlands? Well, the Netherlands finished at the top of their group with wins over the host country Qatar and Senegal, and they tied with Ecuador. They have looked comfortable so far, but they certainly haven't been dominating other teams. The Netherlands has a lot of World Cup experience. They're a three-time World Cup finalist. Most recently in 2010, the Dutch coach said before the tournament that he believes this squad is better than the one he had in 2014 when the team placed third in the tournament. We expect it to be an exciting game. Both teams have strong players and will be looking to dominate in possession. It will ultimately come down to goals scored, and the U.S. will be concerned at the prospect of playing without their star forward Christian Pulisic after his injury last night. The game will take place on Saturday here in Doha. We'll see one team advance and the other begin the journey home. Henry. All right, Roxana, thank you. Coming up next for you, it's red and blue. Lawmakers take action in the face of a looming rail strike. What this means for rail workers moving forward. Plus, we'll hear from former Democratic nominee for Vice President Joe Lieberman about the fallout surrounding Trump's dinner with a white supremacist. Red and blue is next. You're streaming CBS News.